funny that duty of trying to explain my checkered past. But let me uh, briefly fess up to a few things so you don't hear it over the corner and think less of me later. So you might as well less of me now. Um, I'm an attorney. I've held elected office, and I'm hoping to car dealership. Is there anything else? <laughs> <laughs> Used cars, absolutely. I thought there was no profession I had missed. That. So I used to be the ombudsman for property rights for the state. I did that for 10 years. Before that, I went out and tried to get land use approvals for truck stops for Flying J Corporation. We didn't call them truck stops, though. To the Planning Commission, they were interstate service centers. <laughs> much, much better sound. Um, I, I also uh, have been a member of the city council in Provo, and that was, of course, a wonderful engaging experience and led me to admire a lot of things that I didn't otherwise understand as much as I did after having that experience. So let me, um, right now I'm in private practice. We run the Utah Land Use Institute, and I'm the city attorney for Providence and help my son who's city attorney for North Ogden. So again, we're in the mix of all this. We uh, are quite involved in impact fees and eminent domain, those kinds of things. But I am the field authority for a couple of jurisdictions as well. For Salt Lake City, for South Salt Lake, for Riverton, Riverdale, excuse me. <laughs> Make sure I got my jurisdiction right. So we want to talk about a field authorities. So there's a slide I want to show that is not one of those that are reproduced in the packet. Because I'm impressed with the people that are in the room, your experience and your understanding of a lot of this. You've already been through a lot of mind use issues. So it'd be much better if we handled this more like a conversation than a dialogue. Basically, when when decisions are challenged, these are the choices that somebody has. If they want to challenge a local land use decision by a county. So the first is, how do you challenge a legislative decision? I remember from what we so ably described this morning, a legislative decision is always made by the commission or the county council. Never by anyone else. A legislative decision involves the zoning ordinance or the zoning map or the an annexation, the general plan, those kinds of things. They're big picture policy decisions. He accurately described the issue we're facing in the courts right now about whether a single zone change is legislative or administrative. That's scary. Because in the past, legislative decisions are tougher to challenge. The rule is, a legislative will stand unless it's really, really stupid. Okay? <laughs> or it's illegal. Because the courts, as Will said, uh, is, are not gonna, want, they don't wanna be the planning commission, they don't wanna make these policy decisions, they wanna leave that to the county commission or the county council to do. But, lately in the issues that relate to referenda initiative, ballot box zoning, the courts have tried to strengthen the ability of citizens to do these things, and by doing that, then they starting to go toward the idea that if we're dealing with a certain development rather than the community-wide issue, we may be willing to call those legislators so we can send them to the ballot box. And, and in some cases, the cities in particular are pushing back, saying, no, this is just one project that ought to be considered administrative. So there's, some, there's a muddle there. But the idea is, if it's legislative, and amending the zoning ordinance has got to be, amending the zoning map is almost, most likely to be, then somebody goes to court, they have to show that it's arbitrary, capricious, or it violates the law. Now there's plenty of laws, but you knew that already. The legislature has met again, and new things are illegal that didn't used to be, and new things are legal that used to be illegal. But if we can keep up with it, those issues get to go to the court without having to go through an appeal authority. The other option, if we want to challenge a legislative decision, is to go through the referendum process. What that means is, 
that within 45 days after a decision is made, and there are shorter deadlines in that process, local citizens can get a certain number of petitions, which I am told is not hard to do if they want to put in the time and throw the whole process into the ballot box. And this can be very disruptive. Um, in Sandy, for example, the Sandy City Council, a few years ago, put together a long process that ended up in a plan for, the, uh, for a large area of undeveloped property. The Boyer Company was coming, of course, a very reputable firm. Walmart and Lowe's and to build a huge project in Sandy, which would, of course, be a, a generous cash cow. It would produce sales tax in bucket loads. And a group of people who opposed to that, including neighbors, those who wanted the land to be a park instead of a commercial complex, competitors, those who had other businesses in the area, put together a petition drive and come up with, you know, eight or 10 or 12,000 signatures in 45 days. This goes to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, go to the ballot box, and 53% of the residents of Sandy approved the project, so it's built today. But if 49% had, had approved it and 51 opposed it, all of that work would have been gone, as was a plan for West Layton this last fall. Because at the fall election, the citizens of Layton overturned the Planning Commission and the City Council's decision to rezone more than 100 acres of land owned by the LDS Church for a mixed use development. So, this is a whole new thing on the horizon that we hadn't seen coming as few as five or six years ago. And some of you already know the stories in your own areas of what this, what this involves. Yes? Greg, I'm assuming the process is all out in Code. Yes, the referendum process is outlined in state code. And probably the time frame we have to file for that. Right, and it's a fairly short time frame. I think within five days they have to come in and gather, get a petition from the town or city or county clerk. And then they, but the total is, if they haven't got the signatures in for the county clerk to verify within 45 days, then it's over. If they do, however, all this chatter you heard Bill talk about vested rights and how if you have an application and it's submitted, Everything's off the table, according to the Supreme Court. A developer like the Boyer Company, who has a six or 12 or 18 month option on a piece of property and wants to bring in a tenant, if Walmart say, look, we need a place and we need to decide within six months, and the residents say, no, we want it to go to the ballot box, the court has said basically, the, the right of initiative and referendum is constitutional so all other considerations are secondary, and the tenants could just leave and find another place. Not because eventually the public might not support the local government's decision, but because it just takes too, too much time. And one of the dilemmas you also face is, according to current law, the legislature tried to amend this and it was not successful this last year. That is, the League of Cities and Towns tried to do it, last month, actually. Um, but it meant resistance because it looked like it was making it much more difficult for citizens to exercise this legislative power. What, it, what the code currently says is that if one of the decisions of your county is referred to the ballot box, you as a county can't expend any resources defending it. What that means is that no salaried person can go out and even talk about it. Because that's county resources if salaried people are spending their energy responding to the initiative. And in the Layton case, the LDS Church chose for its own reasons not to talk about it. They didn't want to get involved in the, in the controversy. So basically you have a vacuum where the neighbors are opposing the project and there is no one supporting it. The city's hands are tied and the developer has chosen to be silent. In the Sandy case, the Boyer Company, however, was it's just the opposite. They were aggressively, eagerly involved in the discussion, represented the city, and took the city, city side in the courtroom, and eventually prevailed in the public ballot. But you can see how complicated it is if we get to that process. 
And I didn't want to, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time unless you do, but that's just one of the new things that relates to this idea of what happens after the decision's made. Any other questions about that? I mean, it can be tricky. In Beaver County, for example, the Mount Holly Development Agreement was considered a legislative act when the county commission adopted it, and the citizens were ready to take the whole thing to the ballot, the approval of the development agreement. And Neil knows more about all this than I do. He'll be talking about development agreements next. But again, this is this is so much more fun than it used to be, don't you think? <laughs> so really what we're talking about with appeal authorities is in the administrative arena. An administrative decision is something like a subdivision approval or a conditional use permit or a site plan review or a building permit, landmarks commission review, variances, even the appeal process itself. Those are all administrative. <coughs> Nobody can challenge those in a courtroom without going through an <coughs> appeal authority. So this is a golden opportunity to do damage control and to try to make sure that whatever happens is consistent with the law, which is that it's not arbitrary and capricious. And what is required of an administrative decision is that the decision must be legal and supported by evidence and the record. And the big problem we have is that local decisions are sometimes not supported by evidence, but by opinion and clamor and and emotion and other considerations. Again, as Will said this morning, once you're in the administrative arena, you're just trying to apply the law. And the planning commission, if the planning commission is given the assignment of approving or denying a conditional use permit, <coughs> or the county commission, if the county commission is the ultimate decision maker on a conditional use permit, can only look at the facts and law, not all kinds of emotional considerations. Question about that? I mean, I can tell you stories. I just don't want to eliminate the conversation if you want to have a conversation, because I'm happy to tell some stories about this. Okay, yes? Why don't you tell us a good story? Okay. <laughs> well, I don't have any good stories, but I'll tell you some stories. <laughs> so this is what an appeal authority does, which is two things. Consider appeals from decisions applying the land use ordinance, no matter who makes them. So if the county commission approves a subdivision, if that's a legislative, an administrative act, nobody can challenge it until they go to the appeal authority. And if the appeal authority speaks, and the county commission doesn't like what the appeal authority did, the county commission has to sue its own appeal authority. Because there is no appeal except to the court from the appeal authority. So there's two options for an appeal authority. One is the traditional board of adjustment, citizen members, public focus, and they, you have this appearance, and likely it is in, in reality the truth, they appear more responsive to the citizens. And that's the reason that many jurisdictions keep them. That's the good news. The bad news is they're more responsive to the citizens. <laughs> and so that's why many jurisdictions have got rid of them. It's hard to recruit and train them and use them effectively because they don't meet that often in a small jurisdiction. There are problems with public clamor and consistency because you have some turnover, but also because there might be decisions made time after time when it appears that nobody cares, and then somebody comes in with an issue that somebody cares about, you have a lot of people turning out. Does the word group home mean anything? <laughs> just say Just say Then, all of a sudden, everybody cares. And if the commission has been very lax in the past, that is, the Board of Adjustment, in granting variances, and these guys want a variance, it's not going to be a happy experience if it's denied. Because when you deny a variance for some protected government use, like a group home, you're wide open. You're naked before the wolves because they're, you know, I'm trying to be a little colorful here. I'm not saying anyone who goes to home is a wolf. But, yet, but in this process, statistically, the potential legal liability is enhanced by using an informal citizen group. 
The option B is an appeals hearing officer. It could be a trained professional or it could be a volunteer. I appeal, appeared before an appeal officer in a little town in central Utah, and the hearing officer was a state trooper. And it worked great. I mean, the trooper understood trying to balance the law and the facts, and he was not a land use expert, but I thought he handled it very well. He knew what meant by evidence and how to document. He knew how to read the law. He had lawyers on three sides. He had the neighbor's lawyer, he had the property owner's lawyer, and he had the city attorney, and he just handled it with a plumb. So, not a bad deal. And by the way, new software is available. <laughs> it may be from the county, but it doesn't have to be. More likely to follow the law and facts, and potential legal liability is reduced. On the other hand, the potential for people to be happy with the result is reduced if, in fact, the goal is to, to respond to public clamor. So we have this tension going on in the whole land use arena. As time has gone by, continually, as you'd expect, people's public expectations have been ratcheted higher and higher, thinking we can control this kind of stuff. We don't have to put up with any negative development. It's called the since you ask phenomenon. Well, if you ask me whether I think your door should be pink or green, I like green. And since you asked me if you could build a house and you haven't mentioned what color your door is, I like green. And so it's, it's just interesting to me. I sat before a planning commission in a county and they were working on a vested right application. In this case, it was submitted, brace yourself for this, 15 years ago. Still vested subdivision application. And the planning commission correctly concluded that they were pretty well tied to the fact that this law would have been approved in 1999, excuse me, this application means they have to approve it now. But now they thought well, we ought to put in a dark sky provision so that they don't have upward glowing lights. And the county attorney said, excuse me, there's no dark sky ordinance. And they said, well no, we just think it would be nice. And the, the, the developer said, but our application conforms with the ordinance the way it was written. And the person on the planning commission says, yes, but we're supposed to promote the general welfare. So we think it would be in the general welfare to have a re restriction saying all your lights have to be by the dark sky standards. I mean, it, we get this idea that somehow because someone's in front of us, then we can pretty well, it's like decorating a Christmas tree. Let's hang a few ornaments on this application and do whatever we want. And that's the process that gets people into real trouble. Because if lawsuit follows, the county is very likely to lose that lawsuit, and the expense and hassle of going through this is no fun for anybody. On the other hand, if there's a bunch of residents that are saying dark sky, dark sky, dark sky, then I understand the dilemma. Choosing an appropriate appeal process, using an impartial, seasoned, fair, you know, trained hearing officer, for better or for worse, will get us where the law wants us to go, um, rather than off onto some tangent as a result of public plan. Question about that? We welcome contrasting points of view from responsible individuals. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about some examples of appeals. And these are in your materials, so I don't, I don't talk about them. You've got them written down. So here's the story. This is Draper, and the scenic hillsides of Draper. Um, someone comes along and wants to build a house. Now the Draper ordinance at the time says you can't build a house if your if your if your lot slopes more than 30 percent without the permission of the planning commission. So they go to get permission of the planning commission. The applicant submits the application, the neighbors are notified, the neighbors show up, clamor, 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 and the planning commission says, no, you can't build there. Now, I believe, as Wilf suggested, that that was a taking, because there was no evidence in the record supporting why it would be 
specifically a hazard for anyone to use this property for some economic revival use. But despite that issue, it set that aside, the property owner says, well, shoot, and goes away. Then, some time later, the application comes forward again. I don't know whether it's the same guy or somebody else, but they say we want to build on this lot. Planning Commission sends out the notices, holds the hearing. At the hearing, here's the developer saying, I want to build on this lot. And the planning chair says, who's opposed to this? And the room is silent. Now, this threw the chair off because he or she knew that there had been a, 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 a protest before. But now we're in a situation where a public climber plays a, a, a role or doesn't. The chair says, okay, well, if nobody's opposed to it, then go ahead. So the person doesn't go ahead immediately, but a few weeks later, there's a cement truck and the bulldozer, you know, we're excavating the property. At this point, the neighbors notice and have, well, I'm a lawyer, so I'll use a legal term for this. Nuclear hissy fit. <laughs> <laughs> and they go to the city council. And the city council says, why, this is outrageous. These people somehow didn't let the neighbors know, or, I mean, we don't think there was a technical flaw. The case doesn't turn on a technical flaw. But the city council red tags the project and says, we're not allowing this to happen because the neighbors are upset. And the builder says, excuse me, but there's a deadline to file an appeal, and it passed. And the city council said, excuse me, we're the city council. <laughs> and the court said, there's a deadline, and it wasn't, there was no appeal file. So the rule here is that the rules related to the appeal authority apply to everybody. And Draper said, well, 10 or 20 days is an awful short time. And the court said, I'm just making this up. <laughs> well, then why did you pick that day? And it was up to the city council to decide how much time there is to appeal a decision. They, the court obviously not moved by the fact that the city ought to know that the city planning commission made a decision. I mean, who else would know if the city didn't know? <clears throat> but the rules apply to everybody. And that's why if the Board of Appeals rules against the city, the city itself has to sue if it wants to. It can't go back and undo what the board has done. Although there might be ways to get the board to reconsider and there might be some procedural way to do that, typically it finds it's final for everybody. It's important that the, that the process used due process, that they go through the quasi-judicial review, standard, which is in your materials. Again, I won't focus too much on that. And this, um, I guess I'm going to go back to this slide. There are two standards that are options that the local government decides. And one option is that the appeal authority hears these things de novo. That is, the appeal authority makes a decision as if there had not been a decision made as it is new. That is the Latin phrase de novo. I like this idea. It gives another complete bite of the apple for the appeal authority. Thus, you know, it's a little unwieldy. On the other hand, it saves the lay person who appealed, who appeared before a decision maker only to have a decision made based on not necessarily a complete and professional presentation. And this happens often, where a person will go in, for example, on a non-conforming use and say, I have a non-conforming use. And the neighbors will stand up and say, well, you, do, you don't for this reason or you don't for that reason. Or perish the thought, the neighbors hire an attorney. The attorney shows up and says, well, this is why we don't think it's a non-conforming use. For example, they didn't have a business license. Well, in my mind, I'm not sure that's relevant, but that's a, that's a technical legal question as to whether or not you have to have a business license to actually continue in non-conforming use. I don't think that's necessary. But they convinced the planning commission was necessary, and so the planning commission says, okay, you have no non-conforming use. The landowner is running a hundreds of thousand dollars a year business, and now must go to the appeal authority without the chance to submit any new information. So again, I like the de novo option. The other option is the land, the land use appeal authority can only hear the information 
that was presented to the original city. In Salt Lake City, they bifurcated this, and as the appeal authority, I can hear any decision by an administrative person, de novo, brand new. But if the decision is by the Planning Commission or the Landmarks Commission, because of their expertise and the process they go through, then I have to hear those on the record. Salt Lake City is a sophisticated place, and you can tell them I said that, you know. <laughs> and so I, I don't find that disarming. But in smaller communities, I just my preference again would be novel. Again, it's a much better protection for the legal process. That then gives the appeal authority hearing officer, if you have such a person, the chance to really build a record, tie the loose ends together, cross the T's, dot the I's, and make sure that the decisions go through that it's challenged. And one of the phenomenon that's occurred in Salt Lake City, the Board of Adjustment, which until the beginning of last year was in full force and effect, would meet monthly. I've only been there twice in the last three, four or five months. I don't know whether the words got out that I'm just a hard-nosed old guy, but they're just, the, the city is able to manage its land use without the uncertainty of what the Board of Adjustment might do because the staff is able to tell those involved and they know, to the extent that it's true, that these decisions we made on the merits and we know we can predict this one coming. It's been said by people wiser than I that probably 90% of all variances granted don't meet the standards. And I think you probably agree in your experience that's probably the case too. That doesn't mean those other 10% aren't important. But we'll talk about that in a minute if we have time. Any question about the standard of review? Comment, argument, story, anecdote? Okay. So here's the story. This is about interpreting the ordinance. So one of the things that the appeal authority has to do is when a decision is made, then it might be challenged based on the law or on the facts. In this case, it was a decision based on the law. This is Sandy, very attractive place. Um, you can see the hill, uh, you know, Mount Olympus and the foothills in the, in the background, which play a large part in our story. In this lovely Sandy neighborhood is Steve Brown's house. And Steve Brown's house looks pretty much like everybody else on the street, except on weekends when he rents it to families from California or other places who want to ski in those hills. And the neighbors are amused by this. They're saying, he's running a motel. And the city says, well, he can't run a motel in a residential zone. So they go to, the, uh, to Steve, the zoning administrator does, and says, Steve, you're running a business, a hotel in a residential zone. So cut it out. And Steve says, could you just show me in the ordinance where it says I can't rent my house overnight to a family? And they said, yeah, right here it says, uh, the residential neighborhoods of Sandy are for the peace and quiet enjoyment of families in the neighborhood. See, you can't rent it out overnight. <laughs> and Steve and later the Court of Appeals said, but other people in the neighborhood are renting to families. And the city said, well, yeah, they got these year or two year or three year leases. And Steve has a one year, one night lease. But they're all just leasing. And the court of appeals basically said, you can't interpret ordinances to say things they don't say. So if you're allowing people to rent their homes, and I think there wouldn't be any way not to allow people to rent their homes, that would be too much an encroachment on private property rights. But if you allow people to rent their homes, absent any other provision of the contrary, that means they can rent it for an hour, or rent it for a week, or rent it for 10 years. <clears throat> so the court said, we're going to interpret ordinances in favor of the use of property. <clears throat> because zoning ordinances are in derogation of a property owner's common law right to unrestricted use of his or her property, provisions that are in restricting property issues should be strictly construed, and provisions permitting property uses should be liberally construed in favor of the property owner. And that's the standard that the appeal authority should use. In other words, remember we said that any law that the local government writes is going to be upheld by the court unless it's really, really stupid or illegal? That is broad deference to the local government to write the law. Then the pendulum swings the other way. When it comes to interpreting the law, the deference is flipped the other way. 
so the law could be written any way it needs to be written to protect the general welfare. But once it's written, should, people should be able to rely on it and do anything that the law doesn't prohibit. So could Sandy have passed a law that said you can't rent your house overnight? Absolutely. Did they? Yes, they did, after Steve Brown's case. Does that mean Steve's house is closed down? He was grandfathered. He had a non-confirmed use. Actually, the city bought the house. It ended up being taken care of that way. But it's, uh, it's just, you know, we can regulate anything we decide to regulate that makes any sense at all as far as the general welfare, unless the heavy hand of the state legislature or the federal government have stepped in and interfered with completely unfettered jurisdiction. For example, the federal government and the interpretations of the federal law and constitution require us to allow adult businesses and group homes and cell towers and billboards and all those kinds of things. But absent that labyrinth, the law we're bringing of overarching regulation, local government entities have a lot of flexibility. Any question about this? Interpreting the law? Okay. So we look first to the plain language, we construe ambiguity in favor of the use of property, we preserve the intent of the ordinance if there's room for interpretation, we don't create a conflict between provisions of the ordinance if we don't have to, we use the specific to trump the general, and we give a reasonable and sensible interpretation and avoid absolute results. Um, local communities have to follow their own ordinances. And here's a story that gets a little close to home. This is a county involved in this case, Salt Lake County. This is a, an aerial photograph of part of Salt Lake County that remained relatively undisturbed and originally used until maybe 10 years or so ago. You can see, you know, there's kind of a natural water feature here, and these homes are situated along peaceful county streets, even though they are relatively close. They're surrounded by municipalities. This is about 10th East and 70th South, as it looked about 10 years ago. Now, those of you who are active shoppers have already calculated what that is. That is this. This is Walmart, Ross Dress for Less, Bed Back and Beyond, Mr. Mac, and these houses are in low picture. <laughs> so what happened in this case was the county and Hermes Development came up with an opportunity to create another one of these very successful cash-generating sales tax factories in Salt Lake County. This area is now in Midvale. But the county did not have a redevelopment agency and did not have or use the power of eminent domain. So they decided they would just work around these houses since the gentleman who lived there, Mr. Croxford, was in his 90s at the time and his family vociferously objected to displacing him. In fact, they objected long and loud and hard over the entire development time. And when the development was approved, they tried to get a court order to stop it. The judge refused to give the court order. But he said to the developer, you're proceeding at your own peril. And this is what was built. You see the comparison? This is how you get to the Croxford property. This is a street sign showing that it's still a street. This is the home, and if I had taken a step back, when I took this picture, I would have fallen into the Walmart trash compactor off a three-foot high retaining wall. So what the, what the Culbertson, Anderson, or Johnson, excuse me, Crossford family said is that the county had violated its own ordinances by allowing this. The two specific violations suggested were, first of all, the county has a street standard. You can only build a county road if it's 50 feet wide. And it also had a provision in the conditional use permit on the project that everywhere the project above the public road, it had to have 20 foot of setback, which was to be landscaped. So this is maybe 20 feet wide at the outside, and this is not landscaping, like this little green. <laughs> so the county basically gave the go-ahead, and the developer went ahead and built 
even though they had a citizen and a lawsuit pending claiming the county was not following its own ordinances. Does the county plow? Pardon? Does the county plow that? I think they might. In the Kirk case, and I, I, you'd have to make up the dialogue. I wasn't there, and it's not in the opinion, but the facts, would, the facts would support this kind of a conversation going on in more simple terms in the legal jargon that went on. The court could say, well, is it a public street? And the county would say, no, we closed it. And the court would say, well, show me in the ordinance how you define a closed street. And the county would say, well, it's not in the ordinance. We just closed it. And the court said, well, in the ordinance, we have two kinds of streets, public streets and private streets. Now, who owns the street? Now, do you think in the middle of all this, the county said, thank you for suing us. Here's the deed to the, your half of the street. If they had, it might have been a good thing. Well, they kept the street. So there's no question it's a public street. It's still in the county's name. And then the court said, county, you created this space to protect people in the exact situation the Crocsford family's in. Right now, the way it is, you can't get a garbage truck in there. And how a fire truck would turn around, I mean, you violated everything that there is that the county tried to protect with its standards, its fire code, its building code, and its street standards. So what the court said is, where the encroachment is deliberate and constitutes a willful and intentional taking of another's land, equity may require its restoration without regard to the relative inconvenience or hardship which may result from its removal. Tear the buildings down. Wow. Now, this went to our Supreme Court three times. And the last time the court said, are you listening? Tear the buildings down. Actually, that was the second time. The third time they said, by the way, county, you need to pay these guys about a half a million dollars a week at least. So, now I know that's the sort of thing that Johnny loves to hear. <laughs> that a county not only had all these damages, but also had to pay legal fees. So, this sort of process indicates that just like everyone else, counties must follow the rules that counties set. And when, when the results are harsh, they still may be the results that are enforced. Did they tear them down? Unfortunately, for me, in the story, I don't have a picture of a bulldozer tearing into Ross Dresserless. But if you are a careful shopper, you already know that Ross Dresserless relocated in anticipation of the demolition, and then the family settled after Mr. Proxford had passed away. Neil, you know more about I happened to be over there one day, and the back half of that building was going down. I took a picture of it. I'll show it to you. Wow. Okay. So Neil has the picture of the bulldozer. <laughs> no bulldozer, just a half a building. Half a building gone. Yeah. So these have real consequences. And local government officials, one of the dangers, one of the dangers we face is we're only listening to ourselves. We talk to each other, and we reinforce our opinion of what ought to happen, and that gives us the sense that we're going to be okay. Now, in this case, the county paid the legal fees, so the developer had to bear the consequences. When you tear down the building, that doesn't mean you tear down the lease with the tenant. And so, no question, there were very significant consequences for the developer that owned the building at the time. This is what the uh, Desert News drew as a way to solve the problem. Tell the sack, setbacks, landscaping, and another one of the daughters, Johnson, Culbertson, Milos were the daughters um, of Mr. Uh, Crossman. <clears throat> so it's, uh, it can really have consequences if you don't follow the rules. Question, comment? I'm doing all the talking. Yes? I don't know much again, but to me it appears to be all about money. Really? Oh, please. <laughs> I made the cynic out of me. <laughs> <laughs>
the Duchenne County Commission, Planning Commission, came out smelling like roses in this deal. They, they are not the most sophisticated people in the world. They only had a staff of one person and a county, part-time county attorney who also did the prosecutions. But what the Planning Commission did, the court said, was dead on right. The Planning Commission looked at the evidence before them and looked at the law. They heard the public clamor. And they said, we are going to approve this because it complies with the law, but the conditions are going to impose include a condition that you can only have 10 boys on the property. And the reason they did that was based on the size of the existing buildings that were going to be used, is my best guess. I wasn't sure. So in this case, everybody appeals it to the county commission. Now, I, it may be that the county commission, it's probably the county commission was the appeal authority. I forget for sure. Let's pretend they are. The county commission is, here's the appeal, not just from the neighbors who didn't want 10 boys, but from the applicant who wanted 16. And the applicant said on the record, look, I have to have 16 boys in there in order to make this pencil out. It won't make any money if I only have 10. So I know you don't want to approve something that's not viable, so I've got to have 16 boys. And the county commission, hearing the clamor, said, okay, you're denied because you've already admitted it's not viable with 10 boys and we won't let you have more than 10, so we're just denying it. The problem with that is you have to follow the ordinance. And you have to follow standards in the ordinance to decide how a condition used to be issued. And there was no standard in the ordinance about economic viability. Now the court allowed that there could have been one, and if there had been, then the county could have taken that into account. But the county could manufacture provisions that are not in the ordinance. I, I would caution against an economic viability requirement because then you're subjecting friends and foes to financial disclosures that you may not think are appropriate in every case. Another thing that came out of this case, the court said, by the way, county, curiously enough, there's another group home. And you approved those not too long ago. So what's different between that one and this one? And requiring some kind of consistency in the application and, and um, interpretation of the ordinance was a key element of this case. That does not mean that if you do it wrong, you've got to keep doing it wrong. But what the court said is, show us why proving that was wrong if you're going to deny this. So in other words, if the county had said we goofed, we shouldn't have approved it, then this wouldn't have been a factor. But the county was silent, even though on the record, the applicant said, by the way, you approved this and our conditions are identical. And there aren't being any other evidence in the record except that statement that they're the same. Then the court also said, then you probably don't have enough evidence in the record to support your denial of this group home. Now, group homes are subject to the Fair Housing Act. And the Fair Housing Act has not only its own set of rules, but its own set of public institutional defenders. And in the suit that flowed from this, not only the developer sued the county, but the state labor board weighed in and to use state resources to file a multi-million dollar suit against the county. Again, the county commission had not been the appeal authority. If an appeals hearing officer might have heard this, instead, there could have been a lot less concern for the county, its residents, and its insurance carrier. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, I'm I'm wrapped it up, and I'm a minute early, so I'm going to go while I'm in here. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.